The world has been going through a time of rapid economic, political, and cultural change. The year 2020 has only exacerbated it. Some things that we believe in will seem foolish in the years to come. The way we operate our economies will be radically different from 2005, and social movements that will divide the next generation are starting to appear right now. Institutions that were once fervently defended are now deemed crooked or obsolete. Some nations will rise while others will fall, and others still will forge their own paths. Former enemies have become friends, and former friends now have opposing interests. The world, as it always is, is churning. We will finally have what George Bush Sr. proclaimed in 1990, a new world order. But before we look at the political, military, and economic realities of what is to come, we must understand what the old world order is, what it represents, and what its death means. To understand what will happen in the future, we must look to the past. In this entry of the 10,000, we will take a look at the Bretton Woods system and the post-war order. This is the 10,000. If you enjoy the content, like and subscribe to help support the channel. July 1st, 1944. The Second World War was raging. Operation Overlord was still taking place. It had been less than a month since Western troops stormed Omaha Beach. Allied forces were fighting for a position in northern France while their brothers, fathers, and sons were advancing slowly northward through the Italian peninsula. Soviet troops were struggling westward across the North European plain, and a naval game of chess was being played on the Western Pacific. By the end of the war, about 80 million men, women, and children had died, around 3% of the world's population at the time. It was one of the darkest eras of human history, but in a few years, that era would end. As young men in Europe and the Pacific were dying for a free world, old men in America were building it. July 1st was the day representatives from 44 countries gathered for a conference in a posh ski resort in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. It was a meeting that would look much like Davos today, but unlike Davos, this meeting would serve a purpose. What would come out of the conference would be a new world order. The American-led order, the Bretton Woods system, or the international rules-based order. With the United States entry into the Second World War, the conflict was effectively already over. Its economic power and industrial capabilities was at a level that was never seen before in world history. The major question of the conflict was not who would win, but how long can the access last? Just over a quarter century beforehand, America's finance and industry turned the First World War from a near German victory to complete capitulation and economic subjugation. America's might was supreme. By the end of the 40s, the majority of the world was facing the same destitution that Germany faced in the late 19-teens. The conflict destroyed the infrastructure of all the major economies, except for the United States, the only power whose homeland was not disrupted. This destruction posed America with a profound question. How does it remake the world? America had two real choices. Do what every imperial power has done throughout history, subjugate and dominate the enemy, or show an incredible amount of mercy. In terms of domination, the US had every right. It was the monster throughout world history. To the victor goes the spoils. Ayanta placed in Japan, Western Germany, and even in France, Denmark, Norway, and the lowland countries would have not turned heads. In fact, the Soviet Union either absorbed or placed puppet regimes in charge of the territories they had conquered in East and Central Europe, even the ones that were supposedly its allies. Over 100,000 Germans fighting or living in Central and Eastern Europe were deported and worked as industrial slaves in the Soviet labor camps. However, when the United States gave its answer in a small town in northern New Hampshire, it was shockingly different. The stated goal of the Bretton Woods system was simple, global free trade. This free trade would be an essential part in rebuilding Europe. To achieve this, the United States created four institutions. The first two of these institutions were created to facilitate world economic growth with American funding. The first, the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, was created to encourage exchange rate stability and financial flows. The second was the International Bank for Recovery and Development, or IBRD, whose function was to fund rebuilding infrastructure in destroyed nations. The United States not only provided generous loans to destroyed countries, but it also became the world's lender of last resort. The third institution was the rules of the game, a global monetary system. 
to provide price stability and therefore allow citizens in destroyed countries to accumulate wealth through saving, the Bretton Woods system created a series of loose pegs, or fixed exchange rates. The world currencies, such as the franc, pound sterling, and gilder, would be valued at a fixed price to the US dollar. The US dollar would then be fixed to a certain price to gold, and gold could be exchanged for dollars. The fourth and final institution was proclaimed at the end of the conference by U.S. Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau. Open markets. The United States not only encouraged other nations that partook in Bretton Woods to open their markets, but it allowed other nations the ability to operate economically in the United States. The Bretton Woods Agreement and its monetary system laid the groundwork for the world order, international capitalism. Later, there would be other conferences and negotiations before the close of the 40s. These would build on the original Bretton Woods agreements. In them, the United States provided other direct recovery aid, such as the Marshall Plan, and because it was the only true global navy after the war, it subsidized security of global trade with the formation of NATO. As time passed, more countries were added to the list of the new economic world order. Not only was this order for America's wartime allies and neutral powers that wanted to trade, but it was also offered to its former adversaries such as Germany and Japan. Throughout the decades following the Bretton Woods Conference, both of its objectives were achieved. The nations of Europe had been rebuilt with U.S. money, and the citizens of those nations had pocket money to buy houses and cars and live a broadly middle-class lifestyle. The debts that were repaid to the United States were repaid without the destruction of its allies' economies due to the fixed exchange rate and access to the American protected global market. The United States created even more institutions that combined the world markets. The IBRD was placed under the auspices of the World Bank. The United Nations was created to encourage world community and cooperation, and the European Coal and Steel Community, the forerunner of the EU, was fostered by Europe and America to help integrate the European economy. America's European allies were elated, and its former enemies thought it nothing sort of a blessing. In essence, not only did America fund recovery and open its markets to foreign competition, but it would also fund the protection of those markets on the global sea lanes. No power had willingly done this before. The United States was the last man standing after the Second World War, but instead of taking advantage of its strategic position, the U.S. set the terms as if it lost. The U.S. created allies and provided capital, whereas the Soviets and their predecessors created protectorates and extracted resources. It had flipped history on its head. Much of the reason for the Second World War was resource base. Germany had invaded Poland for its agricultural potential and France for its markets. Japan had invaded Southeast Asia for its oil and China for its markets. Germany was upset because it had to pay reparations for the First World War to rebuild France while the German people starved during the Great Depression. Now the U.S. paid reparations because it won, and its markets were forced open for foreign exploit. America's corporations were competed against by outside businesses, and its citizens paid for the reconstruction and defense of foreigners. Why would a nation willingly do this? Why not just take resources and markets from the defeated power and enrich their own nation? The answer was defense. The lie that we are often told about the Bretton Woods system is that it was a system that was made in order to primarily facilitate economic growth. However, this cannot be further from the case. Although it did provide real material benefits to a large part of the world, to the United States, Bretton Woods was not an economic system, as it gave the U.S. no economic benefits. The world order taxed America's workers and eventually exported their jobs. To the Americans, the New World Order was a security apparatus that was bought with the bounty of the American economy. Guaranteed international finance, trade, and protection were honey traps. Bretton Woods was a bribe to fight the Soviet Union. By the end of the Second World War, the United States and Soviet Union were the only nations poised to truly dominate the world. Japan's navy was destroyed and its nation was occupied. Germany was divided and occupied. 
The US exited the war with a far more powerful navy than the British Empire, and Britain and France's overseas possessions grew too expensive to maintain and would soon be decolonized with strong approval from the Americans and Soviets. However, both the Americans and Soviets had strategic reasons not to trust each other. For various reasons, Russia's geopolitical strategy has always been to expand their borders from their unsecurable position in Eastern Europe. In the 16th and 17th centuries, that strategy made the Tsars expand east and colonize Siberia. In the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, it had led Russia into a series of conflicts with the German empires and Poland. If Russia would ever lose its territories in Central Europe, it would become a vulnerable and declining power. For the United States, it could never accept a consolidation of Europe. A hegemony from the Ural Mountains to the Bay of Biscay would pose the U.S. with an existential threat and risk them losing their position as the arbiter of the Atlantic. The board was therefore set for a geostrategic battle that just needed a push. That push given to the world would be primarily from Joseph Stalin, who believed that the clash between the liberal capitalist world and communism was inevitable. This belief in the inevitability of the conflict between liberalism and communism ironically made the conflict real. Seemingly a conventional conflict for the United States would not be a problem. It had an incredibly large population, even more resources, the only economy that was not completely devastated by the war, making up 50% of the world economy, and a robust free financial market. The only problem for the United States is that it was located on the opposite side of the Northern Hemisphere. Despite having the greatest logistical capabilities, the United States would have to face the reality and cost of cumbersome supply lines. It cannot feasibly provide for Europe in the face of a Soviet invasion. The devastation of the Second World War not only made the United States the only player on the court, it made its would-be allies anemic. The Soviet Union, although hurt by the conflict, was still a heavily mechanized power with an even larger population than the United States. If Soviet tanks rolled across the border of Western Germany, America's European allies could provide precious little resistance. For strategic reasons, the United States therefore needed to transfer its wealth to Western Europe for them to grow strong. It needed its European allies to be strong enough so that it could provide resistance or at least a big enough buffer that it could stave off an invasion until American reinforcements arrived. Besides being a buffer to the Soviets, the rebuilt European nations in Japan needed enough wealth and a living standard comparable to America so that there wouldn't be a threat of communist insurgency and an internal overthrow of the system. The American plan did not only need its allies to be with them fighting communism, but it needed them to be on the vanguard of a Soviet offense. The US, however, did not just offer Bretton Woods to its new allies in Western Europe and Japan, but it expanded it wherever it was strategically viable. Shortly after its independence from Britain, India joined the International Order, which denied a Soviet sphere in South Asia. In 1951, Sweden, who did not participate in the Second World War, joined the Bretton Woods system and thus heavily contested the Soviet Union in the Baltic Sea. After the Yom Kippur War, Egypt decided to embed itself more in the international financial order and sought patronage from the United States, thereby denying the USSR its major ally in the region. Most importantly, in 1972, Richard Milhouse Nixon traveled to the People's Republic of China and opened dialogue with Mao Zedong, containing the Soviet Union to the length of its empire and their few satellite states. One by one, in order to improve their economies, the world states joined the American-led order until it encapsulated most of the Earth. This strategy of containment worked until the late 1980s and early 90s, when the Eastern Bloc itself started to cave and what was thought of as unimaginable, the Soviet Empire fell apart. In 1989 and 1990, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, Hungary, and East Germany transitioned from one-party dictatorships into democratic nation-states that were open to capitalism and therefore the Bretton Woods organizations. In 1991, the Soviet Union itself fell apart into 15 different states. 
all of which joined the IMF in the following years. Bretton Woods security institutions such as NATO not only snuggled up on the border of the former Soviet Union in countries such as Poland and Romania, but it also made its way into the former Soviet Union itself in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. By 2004, St. Petersburg was only a two-hour drive, less than 100 miles from NATO territory. For the first time in world history, a world order was not only truly global, but conquered the earth. America's ships protected the world's sea lanes. Its organizations, such as the IMF and United Nations, were global institutions. And the world got smaller, as everyone largely played by the same rules. Almost everyone was under the same umbrella. Everything was static. Almost everyone was on the same side. And human nature ran its destructive course. American real wages started to stagnate in the 1970s. Products that were once made at home and provided secure middle-class jobs were shipped overseas as American workers were outcompeted and supposed allies that outwardly proclaimed they adhere to the American-led order started to abuse the system that America provided. Today, the system of treaties and international organizations that first started with Bretton Woods were losing their relevance. Within the last few months, the U.S. has defunded and stated its intentions on withdrawing from the World Health Organization. President Trump has approved the removal of 9,500 troops out of Germany, weakening the idea of NATO as an alliance. And on June 24th of 2020, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office published a list of $4.3 billion worth of European products that could be subject to new tariffs as early as August, eliminating the notion of free trade with the EU. The problem of the American-led order was it was not a true order. Britain Woods set out to achieve an objective, bribe the world to contain the Soviets. Once it had done that, it failed to bring purpose beyond that objective. A real order must have something to constantly strive for. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union, Bretton Woods institutions did not have anything to fight against. As Frederick Nietzsche said of human nature, what is great in man is that he is a bridge and not a goal. In the next entry of the 10,000, we will go over what happened to the American order after 1989, when its goal was achieved, and how it ultimately became outdated. This has been the 10,000. Thank you for watching. If you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe to help the channel.